Hey, everybody. Welcome to Tone Talk with Mark Uzanski and Dave Friedman. How are you? Uh, it's a special Saturday edition, number 93. Uh, which wow. Our special guest today is Dan Steinhardt of The Gig Rig. Thanks so much for coming on, Dan. How are you? You're so welcome. That intro is banging. Oh, thanks. It was a little <laughs> fast. It sounded it's like... Great. They're really good. I don't. I don't even think I recorded it that fast, though. It was. <laughs> it yeah. Was why like, did it go faster today? I don't know. I don't know. It just seemed to really like just pick up speed and went. It's like, too early. <laughs> We're not used to it. <laughs> <laughs> um. So in the chat, guys, let us know how our microphones are. Um. Would love to know if. We're all even, or if we're like all over the place, because checking one, two. Know. What's that, Dave? Well, we should just all talk, and then everyone can decide if we're all even or not. Yeah, hard man. to tell. Oh, you got uh, you got BV on here as well. Oh yeah, BV's on here. Oh, yeah, he, he helps us. BV's great. Yeah, yeah, he also helps us for our um our, our TPS. Uh, live thing on Mondays as well. Absolute legend. Great to see you, mate. Thank you for coming on and moving your magic. Yeah, Lovely. BB's, been, BB's been fantastic help. Uh, people say the audio is good. Uh, hi, all. Audio is fine. So sounds fantastic. Okay, good. Awesome. David's very slightly hotter, but good. Okay, well, sounds like wonderful. Everything. My mark is slightly lower. All right, let's see if I can change that. He can change it by moving his mic closer into the. <laughs> That's true, but then it would be like in my mouth. <laughs> I don't want it in my mouth. Um, so anyway, uh, I hope everybody's doing good. Dave, have you been? You're in the shop today, right? I'm in the shop today. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I work on Saturdays here, generally. What are you working on at the moment, Dave? I don't know. Uh, good question. Good question. I just finished a rig for someone. He picked it up before the show here. Right. Uh, just a rig that he plays at home, but it's a big wet, dry, wet rack thing almost yes. with pedals and stuff, you know. Yeah, man. Um, then uh, I have some rigs in the other rooms for the band, The Killers. Oh, lovely. That have been the COVID rigs, basically. They've been right. here since the start of COVID. Mm -hmm. And they're actually going to take them out of my space next week, which is fantastic because they're huge. <laughs> but they're mostly a fractal-based rig now. Right. Oh, really? Yeah, it used to be all pedals and amps and junk, and, and then now it's the fractal thing. Sadly. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Dan and I were having this conversation yesterday, as a matter of fact, about the real thing versus, uh, you know, using using these load boxes and IRs or cab, you know, the, the ox and stuff versus your new ISO cab, ISO box you, you got. Yeah. So. I, so, you know, I, I think the technology is amazing for that stuff. And we, you know, we use the ox box and the, 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 you know, the boss one, they're great. Awesome. Um, but I got a, uh, an ISO box from a German, um, maker called Grossman and he's done a really great job of getting rid of the resonant frequencies and stuff in there and basically I punched a hole through the wall because I've got a tiny little studio at home I punched a hole through the wall just to feed this uh, speaker cable and mic cable through and I don't know with the um, you know with all the the load box and stuff they're brilliant but I don't know if it was just me suffering from um, option paralysis, but I, you know, I, I was trying to get a guitar sound with a few things to do some demos from home, and hours and hours and hours just going around the, you know, just trying to find something that connected with me. I plugged this. Um, I just got an old AKG mic on a greenback in the load box, matchless. Uh, 15 watt mode, turned it up. There it is. It was just there, connected, and I just could then crack on and get some work done. So for me, um, you know, I, I'm sure if I spent some time with that stuff and it would get, you know, easier, but it just, there's, I, I talk about this quite a lot on the show, that 
if I was a player like Mick, I could sound good with anything. Mick's got that amazing touch and feel and stuff, and he just sounds amazing. Whatever he picks up, you know, he's that sort of player. But I'm really not that guy. I have to feel connected before anything musical will come out, you know. Otherwise, it's just I'm just regurgitating stuff that I know. Mm. Um, and You're inspired. Yeah, totally. Sorry. But as soon as I feel connected, then stuff can start to happen. Um, yeah, so that was, you know, I love my ISO cab. It's great. Just a bit of um, either Capital Chambers reverb, you know, a, a plug-in or a bit of the um, Ocean Way Studios mm -hmm. just to give it a bit of space. Mm -hmm. It's choice. Really, really great. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't too into IRs, but when I got the Ox, I was quite happy with it. Uh, yeah, the Ox is amazing. It really yeah. is amazing. Like if you've got, um, if you don't have decent mics and you don't have a decent room to mic things up in, uh, it can be really challenging to, you know, to get those sounds and that, that those solutions are fantastic. You know, the Ox, the Boss, Captor X, all those mm -hmm. things, they're all great. But still, you know, there's something about the sticking a mic on a cab. Yeah, you had me thinking. You just, after. Every, you know, exactly. Everything else is um, trying to emulate those things, which is great. The technology is really good. It's getting better and better. But if you have, you know, if, if that's what you're trying to emulate and you can just do that thing, you know, physically, you, you know, you're there. Right. Yeah. And it, I have no excuse. I, I mean, I, I, there's, I can definitely mic up a cab when no one's around or something like that. So I should be yeah. able to do it. Um, but if you're recording at night or, you know, you, you, you've got right. those constrictions, they're, they're fantastic. Right. You know, we right. had, um, I remember doing a rig for Stephen Wilson and where I think the, uh, the camper had not long come out. And we sort of took his bad cats down to a studio and would, you know, micing them up and stuff. And, you know, in that environment, they were, they were fine. You know, they were, they were great. You wouldn't necessarily track albums with that stuff, but if there was a, you just wanted a part, you know, and you didn't have time to run down to whatever studio is, you could pop those in job done, you know, right. so definitely amazing technology. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah, we um, have a question from Modern Vintage. Get it, Dave? What is the best, safest pedal or product to switch between my BE and JJ amp cab stacks, and if possible, run both together? Radial Big Shot ABY. Uh, that will work fine. There's a smaller one you can use. Uh, the radial bones something it's blue it runs on nine volt so you don't have to have the huge pedal with the booster and stuff that works well it's transformer isolated has phase reversal so it's good that's cool uh there was another question early on that i i thought was interesting and i think it's it was a myth you have to have your your mouth towards the mic me yeah, there you go. Yeah, oh, okay. Otherwise, you go away. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> does, does, does touching the tubes with bare fingers really cause a hot spot on the tubes? Uh, no. Yeah, that's that was my understanding as well. So, so anyway, it does leave oily? It can leave oily residue though, and it's it's unsightly. But it's not going to ruin anything. Ruin no no see a big uh, print right on it it's like okay yeah right. what do you think we do yeah yeah i just i just remember um you know when i got my oh you know my old i got a 61 ac30 and i found an original set of um mullards cost a fortune but i remember having a you know one of those cloths and making sure that everything you know didn't have any finger marks right. on them or what you know 
when I took the picture of them, I, did, I didn't want to have any evidence of my hand on the valves. That's all. But uh, yeah, of course, it's right. glass. That's cool. That's cool. I just wanted to, I thought it was a good question for those who might not know. Um, ben Breard, Dan, what happened with the audio, auto, auto pot? It looked like a fantastic idea and execution. Ah, uh, uh, thanks, Ben. Right. So for those that don't know, the auto pot was basically a, I had a little DC motor and I had a bunch of gears and things that you could hook up to a pedal, and, you know, take the, the knob off, hook it up to the pedal, and that would go back to a little MIDI box. And you could program the knob rotation of the pedal. Hmm. And it was a lot of fun. But then I, the, the problem I found was to actually get it connected to the pedal, Every pedal is different, and we had to have so many different options to make sure that the gears and everything worked well. And we'd had a couple of people try it out. Just the amount of customer support it would have taken just made it completely, um, yeah, untenable. It was a really fun thing. Uh, you know, it was in the early days of um, you know me thinking about what comes after G two. And I was thinking about, you know, wouldn't it be great if the next unit could actually control the knob? So that was part of that experiment. Right. And I've still got the prototypes around. They're still really fun, but if they are, the way to connect them to the pedals is, is a bit fiddly. And there are other things now out there that, that are having a go at that stuff. Um, but, yeah, it just when it came down to it, actually supporting people through, you know, getting it right and getting it connected to the pedal was just was going to, be a nightmare yeah that's too bad but it was fun i love that i love doing that stuff loads of fun like prototyping is my favorite thing to do that for a long time how did you get into it the guitar stuff no yeah building stuff i mean ah um that's completely different than playing guitar yeah 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 i well, I was always a guitar player, like, yeah, since I was really young. And I, like I was saying before, it was difficult for me to, you know, I was surrounded by the, the rock scene in Australia when I was growing up was massive. And some really great guitar players. And I, I loved it. I had this real passion for it. I certainly wasn't the most talented musician out there, but there was something it was sonically this thing about the guitar that really connected with me. Uh, I, I just, it was my world. And, but I worked out pretty early on that, well, I'd, I'd always struggled with my sound, you know, and I had all of the state of the art equipment, you know, and I remember thinking, well, if it's state of the art, surely it has to sound the best. It's the newest, shiniest, most expensive thing. Surely it's got to sound everything better than everything that came before. And I was in a session, and the producer that we had, you know, I had my rack of stuff, you know, was, you know, midded up to the eyeballs, and <laughs> and this producer brought in these, you know, crates of old pedals and stuff. And I'm like, what are you doing, man? You're living in the past. This, you know, this is where it's at. Anyway, he said, I'll try this. And he took out an electric mistress and he plugged it in. And I just hit one chord and I sort of, it was so arresting. And I, and this thing was, this was 78. Mm -hmm. um, and I was sort of, everything that I believed in a moment was questioned. It's like, I can't get a sound anything near this with all of this amazing new stuff that i've got and then took out a ce1 and then i was that was it i was done so like from that moment it's like okay um and so I, when I started you know finding these old pedals and went down to guitar was it guitar crazy and kuji and got uh an old tube screamer ce1 electric mistress and a phase 90 and I took them all back home and it was like, you know, 
they all sound amazing. The problem I was having was because I was so used to the MIDI stuff where I could program a sound and go from one sound to the other, you know, with all the delays changing and gains changing and stuff. Um, because the gigs I was doing at the time, I was doing a lot of touring. I was with a, an artist called Max Sharam in Australia, and she was incredible. She's, um, you know, there's a Kate Bush vibe about her and really amazing songs, but they, they were quite complex. And, and um, I had to jump between a lot of different sounds and acoustic guitar back to different electric stuff. And I couldn't do it with the pedals. There was just no way. The other thing was that, you know, I plugged the mistress in, it was great. But if I plugged the CE1 and the Phase 90 in with it, it was like, where, where's that amazing mistress tone gone? You know? Right, right. So anyway, I was with this producer and, um, you know, I was like Hang trying to find a solution okay. for this. Now, a friend of mine was a um, really great guitar tech and he was working with um, a guitar player in Australia called Mark Bazot, who... Uh, a lot of people will know as Johnny Diesel. And he just got a Pete Cornish rig built. And he'd asked me to come over and help him map some MIDI stuff. So I was in this rehearsal studio and he had all this, these Soldano amps and this amazing Pete Cornish pedal board and the racks of stuff. And, you know, at the time, that cost as much as a house in Australia, that rig. And it was doing all the stuff. It was, you know, switching everything in and out beautifully. And it was like, just, there was just no way, you know, um, for, you know, for me personally. And, you know, I was lamenting the fact that I couldn't, you know, where is this, this device that helps me deal with this stuff? And, um, and the producer said, just go and build it yourself. And I thought, okay, yep, fair <laughs> enough. So I started studying and um, studying electronics and stuff and, and I got to a point where I sort of I hit my talent level with electronics. And by that time, I'd moved to England. Uh, I met my was with girlfriend who became my wife. And I started talking to engineers and ended up with an engineer called David Mapleston. And that's how we started the gig rig. So he was, um, he was an engineer, also played a bit, a bit of guitar. I was a guitar player that had you know, a bit of electronics knowledge. And we sort of had this uh, crossover point. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how that all started. And, um, yeah, he was with the business, for, I think, well, 15 years. So he left the business a year ago. Um, and now, yeah, I'm sort of owner of Gig Rig. But that's how it all started. That's great. Well, now do you have a different engineer you work with on some stuff? I've got or... a couple of engineers, yeah, yeah, in my team. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. I mean, engineers are amazing. <laughs> yeah, they're the, they're the ones that have to get it done. Yeah. Here's what totally... I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's you great. Do what? That's, that's part of my <laughs> what I what I'm passionate about. I mean, I I love solving problems. I always have, and you know. So I love coming up with ideas and just and just playing and and then sitting down um, with their engineers and working out what's possible and what's not. But I think because I come from, you know, my back, back my background has always been as a as a player um, who had a had that epiphany moment about being connected, you know, and uh, that was that sort of guided everything for me. Right. And now you have new products. We have lots of new products. Yeah. 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 A whole new series. So, yeah. So G3 and the, and the G3 Atom came out in, well, they were announced in October, started shipping in uh, December. And that was, um, way well, hey, there you go. Look Amazing. Yeah. So that was, you know, G2 came out I think in 2000 and, Oh, 14 i want to say mm -hmm. and they were i mean they were great um they were you know a step up from our our first product um and you know lots of people have used them and loved them and you know 
really honored because of that product that we got to I got to build rigs for some of my heroes. It's been wonderful. Um, one thing that I really wanted to do with uh, G3, um, I love uh, parallel signal paths. And because we do a lot of the, the wet dry stuff on the show, because it's just so much fun. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to incorporate that in the routing of G3, but also, you know, when you're mixing stuff, you know, one thing that I hadn't really found, um, you know, you, you need to be able to phase correct things when you're mixing stuff in parallel. And, you know, so we built all that in to G3, but also cr like MIDI stuff, like really full on MIDI capabilities, mm -hmm. um, you know, sending out to 15 different MIDI messages and CC and expression pedals and all that stuff. Uh, if you look at the pedals that have been coming out the last couple of years, um, you know, pedals from people like Strymon and Chase Bliss and Maris and that have these unbelievable MIDI capabilities. And I love these pedals, you know, the, um, like the the Automaton series from Chase Bliss are, are incredible. The CXM reverb is the best pedal reverb I've ever heard. I think it's just astonishing. And I really wanted to make sure that we could capitalize on all of this um, incredible MIDI ingenuity. I mean, you think about this technology that's been around since like the 70s and the stuff that people are able to do with it. It's still coming up with ingenious ideas. You know, it's wonderful. I think MIDI, MIDI 2.0 is coming out soon as well, which is scary. Um, well, I mean, that's scary. <laughs> That'll change it's, everything. But it's amazing. I think, you know, if, if all this stuff is already ca the capability of the MIDI currently, it's going to be fascinating to see what's, um, what's possible with um, the new version. But, yeah, that's the whole, you know, with G3, I just wanted to make sure that with all of these amazing pedals that you could access all these functions through G3. Sounds awesome. Sounds awesome. Oh, thank you, mate. Yeah, I, I've, um, not, I've, not, I've not messed I've with not it. Messed with this. Now I'll you have, have to get one. Hard. I have to get one out to you guys to have a play. I would love to play. With you it. you had a you got a G two, didn't you, David? We, we, I I do have a G two. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have to um get a G three out to you. Have a play. Yeah, yeah love to. Love to. You see, awesome. now you have an echo yeah, also. There's echo. a little echo going on. Yeah. But then it goes away. Seems like it. So weird crazy well if people are hearing an echo let us know i'm not sure i can fix it but we'll figure it out <laughs> uh, but it went away so why why does it come and go <laughs> that's the question yeah uh bmo says mark echo yeah dave echo but now it's gone so let's we won't focus on it if it comes we'll, back we'll, we'll we'll go with it right now <laughs> yeah exactly um so where can people get the gig rig dan the g3 um, um, it, well, <laughs> so we, okay. We made, we had made, made 500 in the first batch and I, you know, it risked everything. There was a, so much money for us to do this, mm -hmm. but it, it, it only made sense in those sorts of numbers as far as components and that sort of stuff is concerned. And I thought, well, that's going to see us through for 12 months, you know, sh surely. <laughs> so we sold out of the first 500 in just over two days. <laughs> so wow. we're doing everything we possibly can to get the next batch through. Um, so I think we're looking at oh, my production manager is going to kill me if I don't get this right. I think we're looking at April for the next batch shipping. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, stunned by you know, how everyone um, so has gone, yep, that's what I've been after. And yeah. Well, you know, since the pandemic, everyone's home oh. and, uh, and, you know, and they're, and they're just thinking about stuff and what they want to do and make and, yeah. or they have time to make it or they, or I don't know. It's it's been crazy for music gear. Yeah. 
I, I mean, I talked to I talked to a friend of mine yesterday that runs a store in Detroit, and uh, he's like, oh "My God, it's been crazy." Christmas every you know, day. It's like it's just like we ran through everything almost, yeah. you know, like ran out of everything. Yeah. And, and and like Sweetwater is telling me their issue is they can't get the gear fast enough from the manufacturers. Yeah. yeah. To totally. sell it. Yep. Totally. Um, and, um, how I don't know what it's like for you guys over there. We've since um, you know. We've had a massive thing in components over the past few years. Obviously, the Roche laws came out however long ago, and, you know, that was fine. Everyone sort of dealt with that. Mm -hmm. um, but just for everyone who doesn't know, Roche stands for removal of hazardous substances. So some, mm -hmm. you know, things like cadmium and mercury and arsenic that used to be in things like, um, you know, uh, opto-resistors and you know, light-dependent resistors and all this stuff. Yeah. That, you know, mm -hmm. we can't, they can't produce those anymore. Um, so, you know, once they remove those uh, and got the components that we were allowed to use, things, you know, it became a little bit um, more difficult. However, in the past few years, we've found that, you know, just normal through-hole components have become more challenging to get and just decent sized service mount components. Mm. We're, we're seeing situations at the moment where um, if a component becomes like hard to get, there'll be car manufacturers that will go to the company and buy every single component they have just to mm -hmm. make sure they've got stock of this particular ROC or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also making manufacturing challenging you know as well we're finding that we've you know components that six years ago were on a four week to six week lead time and now on a 40 week lead time yeah yeah we we see that too the same right. same same thing um yeah. like even our our like lead time for the pots we use in amps mm. uh has unbelievable lead time now crazy right and and, and it's like you're scrambling to buy up whatever the, there is left yeah. and then you're scrambling to find an alternative while you're waiting for the, other, you know, the long sure. lead time on the components, you know, and, um, and frankly, there's just not as many choices as there once were either. Yeah. That's very you know, true. it's like, I, I mean, for the pots we use, I mean, there, there's hardly any companies that make pots. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, I mean, you have CTS, you have Borns, and you have, you know, alpha. Yeah. And, and for the most, there, I mean, there's a few other specialty pots, Alps and things, but for the most part, those are the three that, you know, sure. all of them come from. And that's like, like you know, there's, there, there's <laughs> like two, two factories now making valves. Is that right? Uh, Well, yeah. The, well, I mean, there's more than one factory in Russia. So there's, there's, I think there's two factories in Russia that are making valves. And then yeah. there's, the Slovakian factory in, you know, Slovakia that do JJ. Oh, um, okay. Right. Right. And the Chinese factory is closed right now. So there is no Chinese tubes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, put another it's, hurt, hurt on a lot of people for things. Yeah. So then you had to find scramble to find alternatives. Uh, if you were using any of them. Yeah. So. Tricky. And you think this is causing, prices to go up as well because it seems like since the last year in the pandemic gear prices have shot up well and i mean maybe not, i'm not saying friedman gear but i'm just saying in general it seems like everything has shot up in price well it's i mean okay th there's a lot there's a lot to that in the u.s i mean there was a unbelievable uh tariffs on everything that came from china yeah and we're in the electronics industry. Everything for the most part comes from China. Yeah. Uh, except for a few items. Um, so, I mean, crazy tariffs, you know, like, you know, you know, you, you something you used, you know, something had a, you know, a say a sub assembly of something like amps we use for our monitors are like, you know, for our full range monitors, we get a full amp assembly, right? Right. 
uh, and when that amp assembly comes in, I mean, it's, it's like 60 or 70 US dollars more than it used to be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, everything's like that, but everything has more. Like, you know, pots that you use are more because, yeah. that you know, the prices shot up on that stuff because, well, there's all these tariffs that we have, you know, to deal with. Yeah. Uh, maybe those tariffs will change soon. Mm. It's tricky, um, man. Pricing is pricing is a is a really interesting thing. I I hate putting prices up. I've got I, I have arguments with um you know our, my uh, financial person all the time, but it's you know it does get to a point where um you know because, like Brexit now has really hit us in Europe. Oh God, I can only imagine. I've heard. It's shipping a shipping a small box now to Germany is costing us like sixty five pounds, you know, to get through through our um uh, uh our, what do I call it um oh god the customs no well oh, no. all that stuff as well and when you um because of all the red tape and everything that goes with it we got to pay extra charges um to our fulfillment house. Mm -hmm. and it's like it's it's unreal oh god <laughs> yeah. and but also because you combine that with um the pandemic and like we would normally ship everything dpd to germany that's great but people are getting groceries delivered now with dpd you know it's right it's that whole side of things is so um full on and so uh at capacity you know because i mean i don't know i don't know what the situation is um between la and florida but like where we are we're, we're locked down um and so everything has to be delivered and we've i probably get you know two or three amazon deliveries every day yeah um you know and then the shopping and everything on top of that all the people out there the heroes out there doing oh, all agree. these deliveries um you know it's uh you know all those guys are working their butts off and there's there's only so much capacity of that yeah no, it's... Uh, th there's nothing locked down here oh really no oh, man. i mean there's limits on things mm. meaning in california i mean there there hasn't work. been a lockdown in california since the beginning of the pandemic Right, okay. Now, California has been relatively locked down, meaning uh, there is no indoor dining. Yeah, okay. You can only, uh, well, and for a minute, there wasn't outdoor dining either. They took that away recently, but they brought it back. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, you, so you can still do you, alfresco. You can meet people outside. Yeah, technically, it's supposed to be from your own uh, bubble household or your yeah. own bubble. Yeah um i don't know if any of that really no one checks that um and uh you know you yeah for you couldn't get your hair cut for a long time right. um, <laughs> uh and stuff but I'm that's open again that's open again so i mean i i don't know see in florida it's like florida's like, wide open yeah pandemic <laughs> what pandemic <laughs> what pandemic it's it's ridiculous it, it is ridiculous. A lot of states are wide open. I mean, yeah. uh, it just it depends on where you are. I mean, it got really bad here for a minute over the holidays, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where we were seeing like 22,000 cases in L.A. County wow. a day. Yeah. Um, but now it's back down to like 2,500 cases. Right. Okay. Ish. Yeah, 3000 it's getting better which, which is which is you know crazy better yeah. it almost like doesn't seem like that's possible but like i don't sometimes i wonder was there really 22000 cases I, this just seems like such a huge figure in a few weeks to change yeah man mm. totally you know but yeah. I, you know i don't know i just look at the figures but then again you think la county also has like 10 million people in it mm so yeah, um, right. uh, you know, there's it. That's a huge. We have a huge population in the state yeah. of California. So, well, so all of these things are impacting business, yeah. you know, and um, 
and unfortunately it does have an impact on on prices but for, you know for anyone watching don't think that manufacturers don't agonize over this stuff because it's you know it's a it's a it's a really big deal putting putting prices up is a really big deal and it's certainly never done flippantly right right um there's a question here from septic does gig rig three use relays or analog switches for switching uh so all solid state switching yeah no no relays no relays in the we got relays for the remote switches to keep the remote switches isolated um but yeah everything else is solid state switching but all, all you know analog all really um Buffers are on the uh, switchable buffers on the input and on the outputs, but yeah, all really high impedance straight through. Yeah, it, it uses the same kind of. Uh, doesn't it use the same sort of switching matrix kind of chip that uh, like the Boss does and things like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they use the same. Uh, RJM is doing that now too. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they 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 really you can good. reorder things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Reorder thing and change the, the signal path and everything. Yeah, it relays, goes. you won't be able to reorder people. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, exactly. Relay is a relay. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Re relays are great, but they, you know, they have limitations. By the way, I want to give a mention to our sponsors. You guys check out Sweetwater in the link that we provide. Sweetwater is a sponsor of the show. And um, if you purchase something from Sweetwater, uh, they give us a little kickback, a little commission. Uh, which helps out the show. So please uh, check out the link and check out Sweetwater. Um, and also I want to give a shout out to Neil Giraldo, who sent us uh, his spirits, three chord spirits. Check it out, guys. If, you, uh, if you're into whiskey or uh, bourbon, um, great stuff, right, Dave? Yeah. Fantastic. Mine are gone. <laughs> <laughs> the rye and the bourbon. I think Which I might like the like rye that? more than the bourbon, but that's my own personal thing. So, okay. The rye. See, this is, I always get this confused. They're both whiskeys. Yeah. Right. But scotch is a whiskey too. Right. We so call it Australian the... fighting wine. <laughs> Uh, that's funny. Um, yeah, so Neil sent us these bottles, and I uh, just wanted to mention his company. If anybody's into that stuff, check it out because he's super cool. And <laughs> they have a um, uh, some of them. I guess some of the proceeds go to musicians in some nice. So yeah, yeah. give back program. Yeah, he he gives back from. He said he said they gives back from day one when he first started the company, not not after he made money at it. Mm -hmm. so yeah that was the that was the mission of the company was to give mm -hmm. back from the start so N neil's great pat benatar great so um anyway this is interesting carlos mendes has said hey uh dan what's your favorite marshall um i had a 50 watt jmp uh from 76 oh. i believe like the the last of the non-master volumes Mm -hmm. and far out man that had the best clean sound it was divine an amazing pedal amplifier i, I gig with that for years um yeah so the, the old jmps i absolutely love and it was all you know it was pcb it was nothing um vintagey hand wired about it it's just a absolutely cracking sounding amplifier that awesome. just didn't have a you know just kept getting louder and louder and louder yeah really great yeah i i i mean i think that's like the last of the really good marshals right dave would you agree the jmps uh, well yeah i mean what well, jmp is a pretty broad yeah there's less statement people. that that jmp lasts from 69 through you know uh, I was talking before they before they launched the, i mean uh, technically through 70 uh, till almost 1980 so right. uh um, the and 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 jmp what is that is that a master volume jmp or a four no, input jmp so yeah, yeah. so there's yeah. there's different 
just different things. I mean, personally, I like anything that has no circuit board, pre sure. pre circuit board. So seventy two ish, half of seventy three. Right. Um. Uh. Because the first circuit boards are a little rough. Right. And and I know this from working on them. Um. They fall apart in your hands, basically. <laughs> if you have to resolder anything on the circuit board or do anything, the traces start just popping up, and they're yeah, just yeah. Sure. they're just kind of awful. They got a little bit better uh, late seventies uh, when it went to like kind of the the square switched uh, Marshalls. Uh, those boards got a lot better. Uh, those that's kind of more like the beginning of the JC. Well, the Master Volume JMP version. They did make sure. four input ones also. And then that turned the master volume one turned into a JC made hunter, which is the same thing as the JMP. It just the JMP had maybe slightly better transformers. What was your favorite amp to work on? Old old Marshalls. Old Marshalls. Yeah. Like right. uh, 73 and before. Mm. I mean, I don't mind working on later ones, but and I do often, but uh I mean, just a, a turret board construction is very easy to change sure. things yeah. on. You know, it's, it's a lot easier. And and sonically as well. Sonically, I think they're better. Yeah, yeah. I think they're a, a little. Well, I mean, it's better, but it, it's well, it depends. Yeah, you, you know, it it different years can be fine. Just depends on the parts that were used in these different years and models and. And if the transformers were as good as the older ones, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm an old Marshall fan. That's, that's home base for me. Right. Awesome. Worked on so many <laughs> over the years. Well, that's your specialty, right? Yeah. I worked on a lot of old fenders too, though. A lot of old, I mean, a lot of old amps period. And I've been in all sorts of stuff. Right, right. Uh, Abracus one, thanks for the super chat. How important would a power conditioner voltage regulator be in having a lower flo noise floor and less hum interference? And this is for a home studio. Mm, well, uh, I, hum interference and a lower noise floor. Generally speaking, none at all. <laughs> I think the, 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 I mean, your, your, you know, some RF interference, if you have some noisy power, maybe if you have a refrigerator turning on and off, it'll probably save the little click that you hear. Yeah. Um, you have dimmer switches and stuff. Yeah. I mean, if you have dimmers in your house, you're screwed no matter what you plug into. It yeah. doesn't make any difference. Uh, if you turn them down at all anywhere in the entire house. Yep. Uh, your guitar is going to buzz like a mother, especially if it's a, a you know, a passive guitar, you know? Yeah. With, and with, also if, considering that, you know, what people are plugging into these, um, you know, those power condition supplies now with a, with a modern home studio and, you know, all the, the digital supplies and everything, and all, all, you know, depending on what you've got plugged into that, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've got a, um, you know, just a little uh, Apollo twin um, yeah. thing set up here, and you know some nice monitors. As soon as the laptop turns on, you can hear the mouse tracking you know, across the pad. It's um, yeah, it, it all depends on the stuff that's being plugged into it because that has all sort of oh, there's yeah, there's all sorts of stuff. I mean, like if like for instance, uh, and and someone that builds rigs will rigs will understand this. Uh, how many products and pedals ship with a wall wart that is noisy? Oh man. Uh, like, and like severely noisy, like completely screwed. Yep. Like, I don't understand how they can ship it. I, I always think that it's, um, that the pedal is only ever going into a clean source when they're testing it. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, like yeah, into a like into that. a clean amp, you might not hear it. Yeah, take that same pedal and put it into a Marshall or something that has some dirt to it. Of course, it's just, you're gonna go, wow, why is it hum? <laughs> All I have is this one pedal and a one spot plugged in. 
Yep. Yeah. You know? I think and, and let me preface that. That's the only the the one one spot they make some good products, but the wall yeah. wart actually is yeah, yeah. not. Yeah. The I, the, I, the 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 power supplies are good. Yeah. The the um, the, the true tone this the true tone yeah. mm -hmm. in there, that's great. But um, if you have a one if you have a one spot wall wart, uh yeah, you can just throw that away. Yeah. <laughs> it it yeah, buzzes. No, it's, it's I have one. I have one. Buzzes. It, I, I'm yeah, well, it's funny because I. It's funny you say this because I was just using that into a pedal into my Sir Ombre down here, mm -hmm. and it was buzzing. Mm -hmm. Couldn't figure out what the yeah. fuck was going on. <laughs> like, yeah, well, that's yeah. it. That's a it. lot of. Yeah. You've also got. Um, I love the rest of their products, though. Yeah, I, I think I think with you know with some of the electro harmonics stuff that it is draws a high current mm -hmm. and they'll include a really cheap power supply just so that you can get it started, mm -hmm. you know, but those things cost pennies, but yeah. you know, it's just, a lot of those pedals, you need a, a, you need a power supply that's got some muscle behind it to be able to get those things working. So mm -hmm. a lot of times they'll just ship it with something to get you started. Um, mm -hmm. And if you are, you know, it might be fine if you, if you are just you know, plugging into your computer or whatever, or, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. If well, the different. vast majority of switching power supplies, which basically everything is these days, mm -hmm. are horrible. The vast majority, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, unless they're designed to do it right. Like, for instance, a Boss PSA 9 volt adapter works flawlessly. Yeah. It's a switching right. supply, but they actually had to have it made. I talked to them about that. Mm -hmm. Have it made a certain way in order to get it quiet. And it, and it just works. Yeah. How how well do you know the guys at Boss, Dave? Oh, I know the president really well. Yeah, yeah, awesome. We, it was really funny. We were out there a couple of years ago, and uh, Yoshi had invited Mick and myself out to come and have a look at their um, the tube app expander. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know this at the time. They said, you know, come out and hang out. And so we were we were with them for a week, and it was. I was so blown away. Those guys are as passionate about mm -hmm. gear as anyone I have ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. I think there's this thing about, you know, because Boss, they make so many things and they churn out this amazing amount of products. But man alive, they are so into it. Mm -hmm. You know, all like, you know, hang out with all the engineers and stuff. And, um, you know, the guy that did the Katana amplifiers and um I, I, I sat down and talked with yoshi for about an hour at a restaurant about capacitors so yoshi is fascinating he used to be on the line making space echoes mm -hmm. right the, the the old re201s and what he would do is he was on the line making these things and then at night after his day job he would study you know, electronics or whatever. He basically had a path to, to get him, not necessarily to get him where he was, but he was so interested in all these things. He'd work all day putting these things together, and then he'd go and study electronics. And once he'd said, okay, now he can come over to the design team, and then he did that, and then he put at, at night he'd go and study something else and mm -hmm. basically built his way up from putting together 201s to now being the president of the company. Yeah. Um, and his story isn't unique. They are, it's fascinating. I just came out of that place with this whole different, you know, mindset of what Boss is as a company. They're, I mean, we all know they're innovators and stuff, but man alive, the passion those guys have for the gear and what they do is incredible. Well, yeah, and him running the company, they've since then have really kept putting out year after year yeah. super cool yeah. products you know yeah. super cool uh yeah. you know like for for me like you know they came out with the dd500 and the dd500 yes. was amazing because it had the vintage digital setting which replicated the old sde 3000 delays right. and uh, and plus it did a whole slew of other things obviously mm -hmm. And what I always like about that delay is it's easy to use. You know, for me, uh, for me, many companies get lost. It, it, it you know, you, you have to look 
page through a million pages of manual and you're reading it and you, and this is me reading it and you're still like, wait, what? <laughs> you know? And, and then you go, okay, well, I got it. I, I, I had this funny thing. I did a rig and there was a, uh, we were, had a rig. We had a DD 500 and a source audio tremolo on it. Right. And uh, the source audio tremolo, we wanted to tap tempo both. Okay. And we wanted to do it in a analog fashion, meaning just a tap tempo box plugged into these boxes because okay. that's how we were going to do it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so I made a custom pedal, you know, tap. It's a dual kind of tap pedal isolated and just, you know, the boss took five seconds to set up to do it. Literally five seconds. Yeah. Without looking at a manual. All right. Just going in the page. Now the source audio. What you realize is in order to turn the external tap on, which it can do, you have to go in to use an editor. In the app. So, yeah, you have to use the editor in the app. So you, yeah. you, for one, have to locate the small little you know USB cable to a regular USB cable. You got to locate that. You got to put the software on your computer. You got to plug it in to do this. This is a just a tremolo box. <laughs> I just yeah. want to tap tempo it, right? right? You have to do all that. And then you realize you actually have to put, it's not just a simple momentary switch latch. You actually have to put in some diodes and resistors and capacitors okay. in order to make it work properly. Right. And by then I wanted to throw it across the room. <laughs> Um, yeah, we did do it, right? But it took hours to finally get it all set up, right? Way too long. Right. And and I, I'm like, I don't get this. Come on, really? <laughs> yeah. If it's... you have an internal tap jack on a pedal, just make it so you plug the pedal in it, and it and taps it the tempo. Yeah, yeah, totally. Done. Yeah, I think you know. I really like, I think Source Audio, like their Collider pedal, I think is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, if you just want a, a single pedal with just some delay and reverb on it, it's wonderful. Um, I think their filter pedal is is exceptional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they've, they've done some amazing thing. I think they've really, um, you know, on the on the technology front, they're, they're really doing some, some, some wonderful stuff. I think there's always a depending on the part of the design that you're focusing on, you know, um, it's, it's really hard to get everything right, you know, mm. um, but they are, you know, they're great and they're passionate and they're, they're, they're you know, they're, they're always pushing. Yeah, sure. I think it's stuff with, you think about a company like boss who've been doing it for so long mm -hmm. and they, so they know the stuff that they have to get right as far as, you know, um you know simple things like you getting the getting the tap right making sure that you know delays between presets all that sort of stuff they they know the stuff that they they it has to be nailed mm -hmm. um and so they're and they're constantly pushing out in other areas like when we talk about the dd500 it's, it's an amazing delay i love that you can have a couple of engines running at the same time mm -hmm. yes. um you know just simple things like that um you know, these, these guys are having these ideas and saying, you know, let's work out a way to do this. And um, and they've got the engineering know-how to make all this stuff happen and still yet make it accessible and and relatively simple. You mm -hmm. know, that's right. it takes a lot of years to get to that point where you're just nailing everything, you know. Um, but, you know, I think there are companies like, um, you know, Source Audio and, and Maris and, you know, Strymon, they, they all have their strengths. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But, I mean, most of the Strymon stuff simple to program, you know? Yeah, totally. Totally. Fix pedal I mean, boards. You know, if, you're, if you've got a, you know, you can't MIDI map in the timeline, you know, so they've got, in, as far as the MIDI stuff is concerned, there's, it's, you know, not the most amazing stuff to, to well, of course you can do stuff with, with a MIDI, but you can't, you know, there are things like that in mm -hmm. the in the Strymon stuff that they haven't spent a lot of time on. Yeah. Um, you know, and 
you know, so like, you know, they've all got the things that they're, they're sort of great at. Um, I love the sound of the Strymons. I think they're great. I, you know, they're Riverside and they're, um, what was the other one? Uh, the, the other overdrive pedal. I was really surprised with how great they sounded. Um, you know, and I think uh, Pete Shelley is a really switched on engineer, really knows his stuff. And, and um, you know, he's got good ears as well. You know, I think the, the, uh, the, they did a delay pedal a couple of years ago, um, which, oh man, my brain. Uh, it's basically got a Echo Rex style thing and a uh, 201 thing in there. New format. And it mm. sounds. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. No, the, but yeah. But every company's got their strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. Yeah. Fix pedal boards with the awesome uh, super chat there. Shazam. Thank you, Tim. That, Who is it? Uh, uh, Tim uh, runs a f um, fix pedal boards is someone who makes some uh, products that are really cool for pedal boards, little risers and different things. But mainly he runs Chapman, um, a Robert F. Chapman company, which is a, a metal company that uh, essentially uh, all the Friedman chassis come from. And uh, Tim, Tim has a side business of fixed pedal boards. He makes pedal boards and different pedal board accessories and different things. And uh, and Tim's a good friend, so thank you, Tim, very much. Um, yeah, thank you. That's a I think comment. you said in the super chat to someone I saw here that you said, I yeah, I owe you more than I could possibly super chat. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, well, I'll keep doing that. <laughs> That's great. So uh, he makes, uh, you know, like chassis for pedals and things for different companies and makes uh, all sorts of metal doodads and gizmos for things. The Strymon he's, Volante. He's our metal house. That's the one. Thank you. Volante. Which one? The, the Volante. Oh, yes. Yeah. Just awesome. Really, really great. I've not. We got, not... I really got into Echo Rex a while ago. Bought a baby Echo Rex and they got such a great sound. He's done such a great job with that pedal of just getting that unique, almost hi-fi quality mm -hmm. that those things have. Really, really cool. Uh, stay curious. I always get something out of these shows. Please keep doing them. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks. We don't plan on stopping. No. Wait till you see our next show. That'll be fun. Oh yeah. What's coming up next? It's it well we're, we're going to be doing a show with uh, uh Michael Nielsen and uh his friend Michael Torin and it's all about 80s rack gear. Oh man. It's all you know oh, even tides and PCM 42s and SDE 3000s uh, and you know anywhere from the crappy stuff that existed cuz a lot of people don't really understand what's what. You know, some people yeah. now might think Oh yeah, that quadriverb was good. No, it was never good. <laughs> you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it, Mick, you know. Mick and I were in uh, at TC Electronic headquarters a few years ago, and we were actually talking to the designer of the uh, twenty two ninety. The, the twenty two ninety. Yeah. And we're like, you know, he's. Is an amazing guy, right? And I said, I, I grabbed and said, Look, just what is it about the 2290? Why does it sound just in like supreme? Mm -hmm. And he said, Well, it's mostly analog. <laughs> he said, The digital part is the interface, but you look inside, it's mostly analog delay, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah, just fascinating. Uh, but you know, things like I think we talked about this last time. Um, the Intellifex oh, yeah, had a anything. chameleon. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. I think that was that was more nineties, though, wasn't it? But that Intellifex, really Intelliverb, and Replifex. Yeah, were all like yeah, yeah. Ones man. from Rocktron. Yep. Uh, that SPX ninety. Well, yeah, well, I'm yeah, sure. That was a you know early thing. That was actually. 
I'm pretty sure the SPX90 was one of the very first MIDI processors. Really? If not possibly the first. Wow. On the market. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was the first. Hmm. Yeah. Yamaha. Yamaha um, was the leader in that when it first yeah, MIDI. When they it first did came out. some great stuff. Um, I remember I was, I was um, a big fan of, remember the Yamaha SG when Carlos Santana was playing those? Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. Those are great guitars. I, yeah, they, they've, Yamaha have done some really, really cool things. Yeah. It's such awesome. a massive company. Um, yeah. They really nailed some stuff. But yeah, I remember those hearing an SPX 90 for the first time and um, yeah, it was like. And now it's vintage. <laughs> yeah, man. It still sounds great. <laughs> It's, so what's really interesting about those, uh, a lot of those things, and you know, you look at the SD three thousand and and that sort of stuff, and the and the preamps that they designed to go with those, mm -hmm. and they are such a massive part of the sound of those units. Yeah, um, sure. And and they and there's a character to them, and the, you know mm -hmm. the way that work with the processing and and they, you know, I think it's. You know, for for me, when I hear like the the CXM, the um, the pedal for the Chase Bliss and Maris collaboration, which is a take on the old Lexicon two two four reverb, and when you hear that, it's got a similar vibe as to those really cool vibey eighties processors. Yeah, you know. And it's a really special thing. Yeah, I, I mean, I, that's what I always, I call that sort of, uh, color. You know, the analog yeah. color of 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 the audio circuits, not the processing, but the audio yeah. circuits that are around the processing. Yeah. Whereas what what made that great? Because I mean, you know, back a PCM forty two, you know, it was like eight bit converters and things and just like you know but it'll still run circles around anything made now i mean yeah, there's right. nothing made now that touches how it sounds yeah um pretty much there's nothing anymore that touches how that stuff sounds mm. uh in pedals too i find that there's some pedals that you know when you plug in to here's this my determining factor for the pedal if i plug in and, and as soon as i play it i go ooh. <laughs> you know oh man then it's a good pedal if you plug in you go okay it's delaying um <laughs> and you're not really excited about it it's not, yeah, I mean, yeah. so and to me that's color that's like sure. distortions or you know like there's the, the analog that's hard to explain what it is there's the, there's yeah. an analog juiciness to the product or something you know yeah, and, totally. and, and a lot of stuff doesn't have it yeah Totally. A lot of stuff's made that's perfectly good and sounds good, but it doesn't yeah. have that X factor. Yeah. You know, and and some stuff does. Yeah. But I, Interesting. The last delay that I plugged into that I, I'd made gooey noises over was the um, the Free the Tone Future Factory. Yes. Oh, yeah. So I plugged that in um, with the CXM reverb, and it was like, we made the noises. <laughs> yeah. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, free the tone delays in general were, were fantastic because they're very Unreal. juicy sounding, like yep. just just gooey, uh, and that's what the old stuff had, you know. That totally, totally that gooey. And again, so yeah, uh, you know, um, Yuki and it, another guy that just gets that yeah. side of things, and um, yeah, super passionate, and yeah, yeah I, I, it's I, great. I, I love it's, that stuff. Yeah, it's what. What's amazing about this industry? There's a couple of things. A, there's space for everyone because everyone's got their own thing. Yeah. But it's like it's almost like the ultimate swap meet because everyone is just so into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really, it's really great. It's really great. It is. I love it. BV, thank you um, for your question. Uh, given MIDI 2.0 is fast approaching, and Tor, our friend, is now at UAD. Can you see a firmware update over the fast UA, uh, USB of the UAD pedals to add MIDI 2.0? I asked Tor this the other day, 
So we've, we're going to be trying out the new UOD pedals. From what I've seen, I think they look, uh, they look great. I think they sound fantastic. Um, but I was really surprised to see they didn't have any MIDI options. So that's what a lot of people have said. Yeah. But they because of that that USB connector, I'm you know I'm hoping it'll be a firmware update, you know, and yeah. a, a MIDI into USB connector. I mean, you can do it. It mm -hmm. just depends on, you know, whether they go that way. I I know when Tor was at TC and he I mean he's I, I love him to bits. He's an amazing guy. I give him credit for really taking you know when they're doing the pedal things heavy at TC. It was really Tor's baby. Mm -hmm. And he really had a vision for that. But he was also the master of saying uh like when they did the ditto Right, and people were saying, "Oh, can it? Um, can I save loops?" Okay, no. Oh, can I? Um, can I? Uh, you know, <laughs> that had a list of questions, and Tor would just go, "Nope, nope, nope doesn't do any of that. Just does this," you know, and that was really, really cool. Um, I think that there's too many possibilities sonically with the new UAD pedals for them not to include MIDI, you know. And so I'm, I'm can't, at some point, I'm, I'm, they're going to have to do it, I think. Because they're, I mean, you know, their plug-in sound, unreal. I use them all the time. Um, but actually, I was having a chat to Mark yesterday, uh, you know, about you can only get a handful on this, uh, the Apollo Twin, because they're so hungry for power that you know you get a couple on there and i'm like i've just recorded guitars i haven't even got anywhere near vocals yet and i completely run out of juice because i'm using a you know a handful of um uad plugins you need the uh, satellite yes yeah, well that's the next step that's the next step yeah. well i've just bought a microphone david so yes. i might have to wait till next week to get the <laughs> next uh, week to do that yes but you can write it off <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah but they're i mean so they're their stuff sounds fantastic, and we all know the lengths that UAD go to to get this stuff right. Um, so, you know, I think the, the fact that pedals just have sound great is a given, but, yeah, I think the MIDI things definitely they are going to have to get that mm -hmm. and move, move on. Cool. Uh, Neener Head DJ. Cool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the super chat. Uh, what do you all think about the Marshall reissue JTM 45 offset that released in 2000? I have it and the one watt version. I love them. Also wondered your opinions, build quality and tone compared to the vintage offsets. Well, those one watts I heard are really cool. Yeah. The one, all the one watt amps were really super cool that they made. Um, the uh, offset was, it was made quite well inside. I mean, like it was a turret board and, use good quality parts and stuff. I think often when, when people do reissues of amplifiers like that, they get a lot of it right. Sometimes the transformers, they don't get quite right. Yeah. And, and I think, and, and I find that weird. I think they should, they could, it's not that hard. I mean, I know we have transformer companies here that can do it and mm. do it where you can't tell. Um, I don't know, but that's Marshall. So I, you know, yeah. I, I don't, uh, uh, often I, I think with Marshall is that they, they're one step short of being great. Sure. Like just one step left out would have made it particularly perfect, you know? Yeah. Right. Uh, Transformers is, is a really interesting thing. Um, I, I guess you know when you look at circuit boards and, and components and stuff, and people can people can buy in certainly, you know, same or similar values to to old amplifiers, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but transformers. It's like I was a um, very dear friend of mine, uh, Jesse Hoff, who does Lazy J amplifiers, mm -hmm. and 
he had a bunch of old uh, transformers from um old deluxes and uh old basements and stuff and we spent a day just going through a bunch of different transformers and it is stunning the difference between you know a new sort of off the shelf thing and what people were producing you know back in the day mm -hmm. and it is such a key part to the the sound and the um you know that the, the feel of the amplifier if that iron's not right it's a real it, it's a real key thing yeah. to miss mm -hmm. and i think a lot of um you know i don't know uh as far as marshall is concerned obviously they know how to build fantastic amplifiers mm -hmm. but but i think companies who are willing to go to the lengths to really get the transformer right you know and not just one that works but one that sounds with the particular amplifier one that works great and sounds fantastic mm -hmm. um yeah it's an extra step that i that all my favorite companies uh make yeah right they put they put the time into that yeah Be lazy j is a great amp by the way man killer he makes cool stuff he uh, really does jack he he's, should be on the show dude get call hook, jesse hook us up he's one of my i totally will so jesse's yeah. one of my favorite people he is he's make a email and uh, uh introduction yeah yeah we'll do i'll do it as soon yeah. as we finish i'll introduce you to jesse oh damn thank you he he is wonderful he's so knowledgeable um he's he's built me a, like a bunch of amplifiers over the years um but yeah I, I i love him to bits i really do he's he's great and, but i love his amps yeah they sound really good really really great i have a cl i have a client that has uh, several of them and that uh and and you know he you know he's in that tweed realm um but they sound really good right you know they yeah. sound right yeah yeah totally well it's you know again it's his passion the neil young mm -hmm. tweed thing is his passion mm -hmm. yeah. and he he's got all those apps he's coming on the show actually and we're going to do a tweed amp special when we're allowed to mix with humans again um, we, we had it all lined up before lockdown um but he's got some real insight into that stuff and you know i've seen him I've, I've been with been with him while he's making amplifiers and he'll take every component and clean the the legs with white spirit and make sure that every connection is bang on mm -hmm. you know he and so that you know when you find guys like that who put so much care stuff into making it you know that's one side of things but then the thing just sounds so great um i've got his the apps i'm using of his now i've got his j20 but he also built me a powered extension cab so oh, it's the power section of the, of the j20 in a cab mm -hmm. and i've got a basically line out from that that goes into the powered cab and it's like just the, the single it, preamp man yeah, it's, it's awesome it's funny you, you say that i so we make a little uh friedman uh, combo right for the dirty shirley mini and the and the uh pink taco mini and it's a a 110 combo so it's really t small you know but uh i i have one in my shop that i use often if i'm repairing a preamp or something yeah. and i just go in the effects loop return yep. and use it as a power amp into this uh, you know into its own speaker and i, I keep like looking at it going i, I need to make that <laughs> i just need yeah. to make the powered cool. 110 speaker and uh but 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 the, my only other problem was it's like well wait a minute that, that's gonna cost about as much as this amp anyway yeah yeah because totally. because you know yeah well it doesn't have the preamp section okay well that's you know that's 30 dollars in parts right so what, all what of the it? like the the kingsley stuff the um uh effectro making these absolutely incredible valve preamps in mm -hmm. pedals mm -hmm. um and so we've done shows before we just plug them into the effects return of hot rod deluxes yeah it's i don't 
I don't know anything about that. I haven't been working on anything like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I was gonna, you know, I was gonna ask you that. Um, I mean, you know, that we must have a a, a Friedman app been lost in the mail, Dave. <laughs> we actually have we actually have to do that, but. We, we, honestly, now it's such well, a pain in the ass to ship into the all, country. <laughs> first of all, we'd, I think next time we're in the US, or if you're in the UK, we'd, we'd love to have you on the show. Yeah, sure. Um, that'd be so much fun. But I think next time we're in the US, we, you know, Nick and I will have to come out and, and hang out. Oh, yeah, sure. That'd Absolutely. Be that'd be great once, once we can all do that. Yeah, man, totally. <laughs> yeah, hopefully soon. Hopefully uh, we don't die before that. <laughs> <laughs> want to get Mike Bilson? Yeah, hopefully not. Uh, Mike Bilson, Dan, please. Can you use your products? Can can you use your products more on that pedal show, like the Wetter Box, Loopy, Avy, Humdinger, QM, in different ways to help us how we can use them? Uh, cheers, Mike. That's very kind. I think I'm very aware with TPS. TPS isn't. I, I don't want it to be a platform. Oh, God, this is, sounds so crazy. It's um, it's similar to what our, like our show. Well, like this is show. why. Well, this is yeah. Why? Yeah, I don't do Friedman as a platform here at all. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. Um, I don't want TBS to be the you know, the platform for Gigrig. Obviously. Uh, which is why I wanted to have you on for Gigrig. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So you know, we, Gigrig has a channel, and we'll do stuff on that. Um, and bless Mick has been so supportive of us. Um, and you know, if an opportunity, you know, when we're talking about parallel mixing and stuff, we use the weather box and you know, that sort of thing. Um, but it's really important that you know, there's a lot of great companies out there doing a lot of really good things, and I want to make sure that we use as broad a range of stuff as possible. Um, so yeah. Uh, but thank you, thank you. Uh, maybe I've gone too far the other way. Uh, you know, I might try and even things up a little bit more. But thank you, that's very kind. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure you, people can understand. You know, the conflict. You know, you want to have an independent show, but you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, I'm. I, you know, I think obviously the success of TPS has been a massive factor in the success of gig rig. Hmm. Um, and it sort of allowed us to do some, some really great things. So, you know, sure. But we do, we do try and keep everything. I mean, you know, like for example, um, we don't do any paid product stuff. You know, you can't pay to have an item appear on the show. Mick and I, um, you know, most of the gear that appears on the show is stuff that we own um if we really if someone sends us something and we really like it um you know we might we'll buy it um i think you know we, we just didn't want to be a paid demo thing right. because there, there are people out there who do that so much better than we ever could you know so we just want to talk about stuff that we we we, we love yeah, you know, and that's, and that's it. We, like when we started, um, the the way that the way the whole show started, uh, it's Mick. Uh, Mick's been a really close friend of mine for a long time, and when he he was the first guy to ever review one of our products, I you know he was working at a uh, magazine called Guitar Buyer at the time, which was my favorite magazine when I first moved to the UK. I, I really loved it. And so I took out Dan, our first product, and it was him and uh, Tim um, that I first met down there. Anyway, so we've been friends ever since. And he saw all my vintage gear, and he asked me to write a column for the magazine, which I ended up doing for years. And then Mick went on to Guitarist Magazine and became editor of all the uh, future publishing guitar media. So um, anyway. I'd always call Mick if I needed an opinion on something. And, you know, we were at a stage in business where, you know, things things were picking up, but I 
I needed some more insight into the, you know, the world of, uh, you know, you know, the, the music industry business and stuff like that. And he's, he just, he knows everyone. So I said, Mick, you know, come on as a consultant, you know, and we'll, and we'll, you know, we can, he said, okay, yep, great, no problem. So I'd call him and we'd say, uh, you know, let's talk about stuff. He'd say, yep, yeah, we'll get into this meeting, but have you seen this new pedal that come out? Oh, yeah, it's amazing. And we'd end up talking for hours about gear. So look, time's run out. Let's catch up next week and we'll have this meeting. And I'd go down a bath and see him. We'd sit down and we'd have the whiteboard out. We'd have all the pens and, yeah, okay, right, we're going to do this. Before you do this, though, have you seen this? And we'd plug it in. We'd just play for hours. And anyway... I was going to NAM and Mick said, Mick had just left his job at Guitarist Magazine. And he gave me a call and said, I'm thinking about coming out, but I, I don't have anywhere to stay. And so, you know, come and stay with me. I've got a, you know, I've got a, if there's a spare bed, come, come and crash. It'd be brilliant fun. And we'll finally have that meeting. You know, we'll finally have that, um, the, you know, the, the, the consultant meeting. Mm. And so, so he came out and then, we spent, we had an hour aside for the meeting. Of course not. It was NAM. All the stuff had come out. It was amazing. We were walking to NAM, and Mick said to me, Let's just do this. We, we're, we're incapable of talking about anything else. I mean, so when Mick calls me up now, and we'll still be on the phone for an hour talking about gear, mm. it's just, you know, we, it's just what we do. Right. So, and that's how the show started. It was. It didn't have any ambition with it. It was like, let's just talk about stuff that we love, and then this is where we are. It's amazing. It's great. How long has it been? Five years, five and a bit years now. Wow. Yeah. Grown fast, very fast. Uh yeah. It's not like you know. I think we've got two hundred and sixty-nine thousand subscribers or whatever. It's. I think. There are lots of YouTube channels that have grown faster. Mm. I think what the TPS thing, I mean, I think so the average view time of a TPS video is 17 minutes. That's not, that's, that is the average watch time. The, the average video is like an hour or whatever. Right. But the average view time is like 17 minutes. The people who are into it and who we love dearly, are like really passionate about it. Because we, it's a lot to have in common with someone. You know, if 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 this gear, if you feeling connected to it, and you're able to express something musically by being connected to this stuff, and we're in any way able to um, inspire people to do that, it's a lot to have in common with someone. You know. Yeah, it's a great community of people. Oh, that's wonderful. I just yeah. so, so grateful for all of them. Uh, I've got a question for both you and Dave. Do you have any experience and from modern vintage again? Thank you for the super chat. Do you have any experience with Dover amps? The DA 50 seems to me the most popular wondering about the quality of parts and thoughts. I have not. No, I'm going to tap out on this one, Dave. I don't know either. I, I know of it, but I don't, I have no idea what it looks like inside. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Peter Lasis, thanks for the super chat. I recently installed an RCA 12 AX7 long plate in V1 of my SLO and was blown away at how much of an improvement it made. Fatter, good compression. Can you explain what changes electrically? Uh, it's a different tube. <laughs> I mean, it, it's just a different sounding tube. I mean, every tube. I mean, even if you take, uh, you know, four of the same brand of tube, um, yeah. they all sound different. Um, I, I mean, like I, I had an SLO here that had all the original GE preamp tubes in it that Mike had put in years ago. Uh, that was super cool. Um, wow. You know, here's the, the thing. Here, here's the thing. Ultimately, here's what you find. Um, you think it changes everything so radically by putting that tube in. Now, if you were to take two of these amps, and one with your tube in, and one and and another one with whatever tubes in it, and you were to put them on an amp switcher, mm. 
and switch in real time and then adjust the knobs to so the amps match yeah i uh, meaning start start with them the same but then the one that doesn't have your favorite rca in it can you turn the knobs to make it sound exactly the same and i bet often you will find you can sure so then you can't tell but yeah. the only way to do any ab experiments like that is in real time with an amp switcher kind of thing you know it's 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 funny it, Yes, they make a difference, but but often you can turn the knobs to get that same sound. Sure. So in the end, it might not matter. It, it, it's a weird thing that I found over time. It's like mm -hmm. so when I do something now, it's like when I want to try out a new 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 when I have when I have to say in production change the kind of tubes we're using. Yeah. I'll retube one amp with the new choices. And do a little experiment and it, with use an amp switcher. Uh, uh, and, you know, and then um, you often can dial them in the same or you'll mm -hmm. find your favorite. You, you just got to listen in a kind of controlled way. Actually, I, I know there's some more questions. I've just got a quick question for Dave because I've been mm -hmm. doing this thing with... Um, effects that recently and i've my favorite effects loops and amplifiers dave are the ones that you've designed mm -hmm. um now my question to you is when you design an effects loop um if you take uh i don't know something it's a preamp that's got a reasonably high output impedance mm -hmm. right are you are you matching the sound of that with that high output impedance before you buffer it or are you just like are you matching that impedance on the input so that the sound is relatively the same if you, you know let's say you've got a you know a yeah so amp. yes correct correct so right. so so like say yes you want to have kind of a the going into the buffer section needs to be yeah. a relatively high impedance or it loads down the uh, well it depends on where you're placing this loop or it loads down the eq or the circuit before it which sure. changes the tone yeah, yeah um but also my my loops are truly pedal level so right. it, we drop that signal quite a bit and um, then you make it up on the turn and then we make it up on the tail yeah. end yeah and it's pretty transparent yeah no i think of all the effects loops i've i've tried to do stuff with um, your design is consistently great sounding. I've just been trying to work with this. I mean, I've got a matchless DC30, which I love, but far out, man. The the voltage on the send is just like nothing works with it. Um, no, yeah, no, the DC30. No, no, that's a passive loop. Yeah, yeah, but and yeah, totally. Uh, but there's lots of passive loops that I've worked that doesn't have that crazy. Um, output voltage like the dc30 does and it's certainly part of the it's part of that sound with this amplifier especially if you're using like the ef86 channel and that's dimed and stuff mm -hmm. um but i've yeah i just find that consistently with um yeah the, from the effects loops that i found that you designed have been my favorite loops to 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 work with and you know build rigs for because it's just they, they yeah, work so well it's it's real it's a, um, I think getting that stuff right is a lot trickier than people realize to make them sound right. Yeah. And, and also people, people often ask me sometimes to do certain things. Can you put a loop in, you know, this, I, I can't, the, hmm, how do I say this? Uh, so vintage style amplifiers shouldn't have a loop ever. Yeah, right. Uh, meaning like something that derives its distortion, shall you, shall you say, from cranking it up. Yeah. Um, even if it's a small deluxe or something, there's no point in putting a loop in an amp like that because yeah. you're distorting the power section. So and in yeah. turn, yes. you're distorting your effects anyway. So you yeah. might as well just put them in front of the amp. Yeah. Uh, so anything, anything even with a post phase inverter master also doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. Because you're distorting the phase inverter, and then the effects sound distorted, and they don't sound right anyway. Yeah. 
Yeah. So like a lot of my amps don't do that. It's like a clean power section where the most of the stuff's coming from the preamp. So yeah. in turn, it's like a preamp power amp situation. So, so it works with that into the preamp. Yeah. So mm -hmm. Then you can work with that effects loop. So, yeah. Right. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And nice. uh, so yeah. And if you get any, and if you get in a situation where you want to use your vintage amp or something, you get a fry fry at power station. They're unreal. And and They're load so it good. down it's and then use the loop that. in that and boom, yep. there you go. Yep. Yeah, so, they're you know. they're really great. I was gonna ask you as well, do you make anything with an EF eighty six channel? No, and I will never. Right, because they're so problematic. Yeah, 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 yeah. In EF eighty six anymore is it's just like it was a problematic tube originally. Yeah, of course. Uh it, it's just, you know, uh yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's microphonic like crazy and you know i've so i've got like a, an old ac30 i've got a really old i got a 1961 ac10 twin with the original ef86 side and i know that um like the new a the new ac30s for example just use one side of a 12x7 on the normal mm -hmm. channel mm -hmm. you know so it's you know no um tone stack or anything like that yeah. similar to the original ef86 side mm-hmm but there is, for me, there's still something about that, about that valve, that I haven't really been able to replicate. Yeah. Because um, you know the crazy gain, and but you're right, they're so temperamental. Yeah. Um, I had a I had a a London from 65 amps mm -hmm. that had one side was the the uh, 20 watt Marshall. Yeah. You know, and the other side was the uh, AC15 mm -hmm. with the EF86 channel, and uh, I remember talking to Dan Bull about that and about just the trouble trying to get good production <laughs> of EF86 valves. Yeah, yeah, nightmare. Sorry, yeah. I'm I'm really disappointed. It's you know I rarely get to talk to you, so <laughs> no, it's fine. It's I fine. just want to get them. Out. Oh, that's cool. Uh, Miguel Moreno, uh, question for Dave, would the pink taco be a good studio tool? I would say yes. Um, also, are you doing Wolfgang's rig now? I was curious about that as well. I, I don't know. I mean, there hasn't been a, I don't think there's been anything. I mean, from what I saw when he, they played live, it was just a couple pedals, tiny, you know, into the amp. So, right. Uh, uh, will I, I mean, there's probably a good chance. Yeah. If, if there needs to be something done. Mm hmm cool and i think the pink taco is a good studio tool yeah for sure uh let's see we got a couple more i don't want to miss them um anthony chabala thanks for the super chat dan please tell us how it came to be that you did gem archer's pedal board he is the most underrated guitarist out there uh okay so gem uh plays for noel gallagher who i did a ring for um, basically, Noel's producer is a very dear friend of mine, a guy called Paul Stacey, who I'm actually going to be playing in a band with next year, which I'm so excited about. Hmm. Um, well, as soon as we can, you know, gather with humans. Right. And Noel asked me to put together a rig for him in the studio, uh, which I did, and he loved and, um, you know, did uh, the whole album with this, this board. And so I became friendly with Noel, and Noel asked me to get in contact with Gem was coming on the road with him to do a rig for him, um, which I did. I went down and hung out with Gem in his studio, and um, Gem had this, you know, was really clear about what he wanted, so I put the rig together for him, and he's, he toured that with, still touring that with, well, toured that up to Pandemic. and uh, But, yeah, Gem is is wonderful, just so, so tasty. Um, yeah, I've, like, played with, obviously, guitar player from Oasis and, you know, now touring with Noel. Super cool. Uh, Plexico, hi all. How does headroom impact pedal tone, i.e. Chase Bliss, Automatone, 1978 CX, other pedals you're aware of with high headroom, and I love you. <laughs> Thank you. That's funny. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so headroom is really interesting. Um, when you're with, – with a reverb pedal, when you're – when you've got – gain going into it and you're dealing with transients um headroom is super important but headrooms only headroom is really important but it's one important factor of like 20 important things you know so um 
it's you know great to have a high high headroom but not at the expense of noise floor and all that sort of stuff so yeah headroom is headroom is really important it's one of a bunch of really important things okay i want to address this question joe soap why would wolf work with dave and then you thought you said uh we've consistently shit on evh amps see that no no we don't um i even own Wait, EVH, what? yeah no. i own an evh amp um and i've got the stealth and i think it's fantastic and to answer your question why would wolf want to work with dave well because his father worked with dave um and well and dave, also he i worked with him he, i did his bass rig for all his touring with van halen yeah and i don't shit on evh products either i mean i uh, you know i i like ed's older this. sound better look at this guy mark but, even hid his evh amp after that episode i sold the amp you jerk off <laughs> i'm sorry i'm just not gonna take, i'm not gonna take bullshit from people anymore um i didn't hide my amp ever i own an evh amp i also have a friedman b100 that you don't see but it's behind my chair <laughs> god people just get a life okay thank you um okay move on piss me off i love evh stuff i've got about six of their guitars so don't tell me we shit on evh stuff i'm a huge fan i've got a sign right here you see that <laughs> you see the hat that i'm wearing jerk off <laughs> all right sorry i'm sorry it just pissed me off there dan we're gonna get back to you <laughs> peter laces <laughs> Uh, just want to say thanks for doing this show. So great watching you guys geek out. Warms my heart and films my soul. Thank you so much. That's the kind of comment I like to see. Very um, kind. Uh, so great. Um, let's see. I know there were other questions. Uh, Mike Jones, I've changed a single tube in an RP7 valve. It's the only tube and can definitely hear a difference in the distortion. Way better sound, but the clean seemed to lose its sparkle. I've never used an RP7. Yeah, I'm not sure either. I don't even remember what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's an interesting one. So, um, well, awesome. Well, Dan, I appreciate you coming on the show. Oh, it's uh, been really great. It's been great to see you guys again. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Do you have um? Do you have any other questions for Dave? I've got so many questions for Dave. It's going to take an episode. <laughs> um, we can always do a um, private meeting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we're, but you know, as always, we're re really keen um, to get your stuff on the show, but we'd love to do it with you. Um, so, you know, as soon as we can travel, but we'll be over there. But, you know, it's an open invitation. If you're ever around, we would love to have you on the show. There's so much to talk about. Um, but oh, I'm yeah. Big fan I mean, of I, yeah, I would love to do it uh, someday, uh, you know, again, when we can uh, totally be freed up a little more to travel again. You know, yeah. I, I was doing a ton of traveling before, uh, and I imagine I will again uh, one one of these days, even if it's a couple years from now. <laughs> yeah, awesome. I think but, I mean, I've, I've built, you know, loads of rigs you know around your gear and stuff and it's just it's always fantastic and the happiest guitar player so it's really great mate well um, you know you know that's that's something to bring up real quick you know the the thing is is I, you know i was a rig builder for years before i made products and mm -hmm. and and the thing is generally i make products to work properly right um there's so many there's so many engineers and things that make wonderful can make wonderful things and make wonderful things but they might have no any no real world experience whatsoever with what works and doesn't work and yeah yeah say so what you know what you can do and not that, do yeah we we talk about all the time nothing nothing works in isolation yeah you know if you if you've got something hanky in a pedal it might not cause an issue in your pedal but it might cause an issue in a pedal four pedals down the chain yeah. you know um so yeah i think that's kind of you know it's obvious in, in your gear and, and you know we're doing stuff with um uh phil x is a really close friend and 
Mm. And, you know, hearing his signature amp was like mind blowing um, when I went swimming with Bon Jovi. And, um, and I was, uh, another one's Tom Quayle bought, had a dirty Shirley and I was yeah. building a river for him. Well, that's, oh my word. Just, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, really great. So, really looking forward to having you on the show. I, I do have a thousand questions, but we'd be here for hours and hours. And my <laughs> hurry's just been delivered. So, um, uh, yeah, but a, a real honor. Great to see you too, Mark. And, you know, thanks oh, so yeah, much for having me. I really appreciate it. Wait, um, we had a couple super chats that just came in. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. A couple <laughs> super chats. So, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to these before you, we let you go eat. Um, good to see Wolf on the other night. Uh, he was on Jimmy Kimmel. Emotional moment for me. Love to Dan and Tone Talk. Thanks, man. Thanks. Thank you, buddy. Loot 89. Really appreciate it. Um, and then there was uh, Mike Bilson again. Dave with Sammy on TPS. Dan, don't forget Sammy. <laughs> oh, Sam <laughs> Sammy Bowler. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Yeah, great. Sammy. Open door. Very yeah. welcome. Sammy's got a new band, which is yeah. cool. Very cool. Uh, and then music therapy Laz Dan been thinking about getting a pedal switcher and looking at the air stuff as well as your mini gig rig. Adam gave me uh, your mini rig uh, gig rig. Adam gave me your thoughts, please. I watch from the beginning to end. Love you guys. Adam, give me your thoughts, please. Looking at the air stuff. What's air stuff? Yeah, I don't know what air stuff means. Uh, I think, and I think you mean looking at the atom. Um, I oh. mean, so quickly, I just, I mean, as far as pedal switches are concerned, um, if 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 your rig warrants a pedal switcher, they can be great. Um, if it if they don't warrant it, then it's it's overkill. If you're using, you know, if you're using lots of combinations and you want to be able to change order and do parallel things and use two amplifiers and get spillover from delay and that sort of stuff and you're using mini <laughs> pedals they're great um if you only ever have one pedal on at a time if you know if you've got three pedals or whatever um you know it might be overkill the thing uh, a, a, a good switcher should do a couple of things it should preserve the tone of the pedals um one thing that you know, I was talking about when I had my my vintage pedals, um, because of the you know the rubbish buffers and stuff, and it, you you chain those things together and things would disappear. Like just that that feeling of being connected. So having those pedals in a good switcher should preserve the sound of those. Of course, if you use those in combination, then you're back to having all those the you know the the preamps and all the mismatched impedances, and that's all that is consistent. Um, but if you, you know, if I go to a sound, you know, I've got 14 pedals on my board, but if I go to a sound that is just my electric mistress, um, going into my RE201, then that is the only thing that's connected and everything else is sort of hard bypassed. Mm -hmm. So in those sorts of rigs, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but you know, if you've got three boss pedals, it's, it, it, it's overkill. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, right. it all depends on the rig, whether it's appropriate for what you need. Um, yeah. No, that makes sense. I definitely want to get the uh, the G3. I, I I'll, I'll to... love to get one out to you guys. Mm -hmm. with, you know, once it's ready. Once, get, once whenever, get, whenever, get, no rush. Would love to get one out to you guys. I, you mentioned before. Yeah, the, uh, would, would love to check one out. Oh, would love to. Yep. I got this pedal. From a guy out in Australia. Check this out. Have you seen this? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Um, it's really cool, but the problem is I can't use it when it's in other with other pedals because yeah. I think like a real CE1. It's got a 50k input pop. Yeah. And yeah. It it, so that so the original CE1 was designed for use with keyboards. And keyboards have got a much lower output impedance and they can drive that uh, 50k pot that's directly on the input um mm -hmm. an old mod for the ce1 is just to take that 50k pot out put a 500k pot in 
and it they you know all of a sudden you get all this top end back it's really great those pedals are really good after a buffer you know mm. but if, if you're having it early on um yeah changing that that pot at the front is a great idea but the really cool thing about that then is that if you then put it in the high mode and crank that up it's the most amazing sounding overdrive oh, really? Uh, oh, really? yeah it's the it's that the preamp in it once you give it love because it's in there all the time as well mm. you know on the original and mm. uh man alive it's fantastic really like we had uh mick and i did a thing at the boss is it the 40th or 50th anniversary i forget which one a few years ago and i had to see you on there and you know my old one and and i said well this is because uh, i heard jim magini from midnight oil use his ce1 in this way and it's like just unreal wow that's cool i don't know if i, I know if davy walked Davey away i don't know if you saw that i picked this up oh cool yeah it's pretty cool it's from from australia yeah but um anyway dan uh thanks so much for coming on everybody make sure you check out the gig rig uh, check out their products. Uh, it's the gigrig.com. Um, and I'll have that link also in our description for this video below, as well as the link for that pedal show. And um, you guys check out that pedal show as well. Always great with you and Dan, uh, Dan and Mick. You guys are great. So oh, cheers, guys. Thanks so much. Great yeah. to see you again. I can't wait till we can all, you know, get together and, you know, share that uh, Australian fighting wine. <laughs> yeah, definitely. sounds good we'll do that brilliant um, cheers guys thanks so much awesome. yeah well hang on a second dan but we'll say goodbye to you uh as we say goodbye to everybody else okay. the next show is february 19th that's with uh michael nielsen and michael torin and that is the rack gear extraordinaire show nice. so we'll talk about that february 19th i believe at 9 p.m um everybody have a great weekend enjoy the week and we'll talk to you soon. Hang on, Dan. We'll say goodbye offline. You're right. <laughs>